Morning, everyone. Welcome back to The Lookout, broadcasting live from a bathroom in a rented house. We're talking about the Dixie Fire. Dixie Fire was active on the southeast and northeast sides yesterday. So um, we're going to jump in here and look a little bit just to orient you to where we are on the southeast side. Here's Quincy. I'm sorry you can't see my pointer, but it's uh, part of broadcasting from a bathroom that your mouse pointer doesn't work. On the left-hand side here, Quincy, right-hand side, Hallelujah Junction, lower portion, Portola. On top, in the center, is Milford. Um, the area we have here in um, gray or tan or pale is um, the Beckworth fire that burned in July. And the Dixie fire wants to be part of that. So um, we've been talking about how the Dixie fire um, during the west the southwest winds last week um, the fire pushed out here um, it was kind of staying on the um, south flank of the walker fire for a while as it pushed up out of genesee valley and then um, it kind of pushed on the ridge here towards the bottom of the screen the big concern was that the fire would come over the ridge with north winds that are forecast to come now that the south winds are over and burn down to the Highway 70 corridor, which is where most people live in Plumas County. So um, I've gotten some pretty good input from people who are out there firing. Um, the, the spread of the fire to the east, um, you know, part of it was the natural wind and blowing around the fire. Part of it, um, the firing that we did didn't help, but it wasn't like um, crews came and just lit the whole ridge off and let it burn down wind. They really got pushed hard by um, the fire's flanking spread and by um, just not having enough resources. Lots of other things happened. So um, I'm thankful to, um, to friends of mine who are out there who've kind of um, given me some intel. We'll, we'll at some point do a more detailed write-up on that whole kind of scenario or the whole saga of how it went down on the lookout. But for now, um, I appreciate all the input I got from people who were there on the ground. Um, the fire has kind of turned a corner here now um, with the wind not on it anymore. Um, it's cooling off a bit here on the flank um, that's closest to Lake Davis, but there's still active fire here. Um, the fire also now that the wind is kind of not just shoving it hard to the east is flanking out towards the Beckworth fire. Um, they pushed in a lot of dozer line trying to keep it from flanking, but as we've seen all over this fire and all of our other fires this year, those lines just aren't holding up unless we've got the resources to fire off of them or um, the wind's blowing away from them. So, uh, I mean, that's the story of the Beckworth too. I mean, these, all these black lines are dozer line inside the burn. So, I mean, we, we keep learning this over and over. We push a lot of dozer line, fire spots over it. Now we can see some spots here on this fire. Um, direct attack, talking to, you know, uh, battalion chiefs are out there. It's just direct attack's not working under these dry conditions. Indirect attacks not working under these conditions unless we have time to do a firing operation. Um, one of the reasons that the fire, you know, did get past this out here earlier was just, you know, we can check the fire up on these lines um, temporarily, but unless we have the resources to go in and cut down all the dead trees along these dozer lines, a uh, tree can easily fall over the line, you know, a day or two after we fire it or the fire hits it. and. Um, it just doesn't hold up. So that's part of being kind of outpaced by these fires. It's just that we can push in all the line we want, but if we don't have crews to snag them, if we don't have crews to patrol them, we don't, we don't have time to get water, you know, access for engines to, to mop up, uh, we, we can't hold these even if we stop the fire there for a day or two. So anyway, uh, looking up Highway 395, this is as of 9.30 last night. Fire was pushing down towards 395. Um, there's dozer line, there's two dozer lines here along 395. Um, even so, you know, fire's probably going to go to 395 if not farther. What we saw on the Beckworth, same thing, we put in a lot of dozer line here. Same thing as the other conversation. If you don't have the resources to hold it, if you don't have the resources to fire it, if you don't have, have the access to get engines in there with water, it's really tough for us to keep a hold of stuff along here. So anyway, um, I mean, the good news here is that there's just um, it's desert. Um, we're not burnt now that we get down to Herlong. You know, we're not burning up a bunch more timber. Bad news is there are people that live out here, and um, 
all kinds of military infrastructure. Um, not sure if they still have nukes out at Herlong, but they used to. Um, but anyway, they they take good care of that stuff. I don't think that the fire's gonna uh, give us any real problems out there. But yep, Herlong, Herlong's a weird place. Yep, I mean, what's in those? Yeah. When I was a kid, they used to blow up bombs out here um, every Wednesday at three o'clock. Uh, they would blow up their old bombs, and you could feel it in Westwood. You could feel it in Silver Lake. You could feel it in Red Bluff. You could feel it in, you know, if you knew, if you're from here, you're down in Chico, and you'd hear this kind of rah, rah, rah. three o'clock on a Wednesday. Oh, yep, they're blowing up bombs in Herlong. That's a long ways away. Anyway, geography lessons over. Uh, moving on up here to um, Taylorsville. We talked a little bit um, yesterday about, you know, potential plan to connect the fire from here over to what burned earlier on Mount Huff, which isn't shown on this map, but um, there's some new heat up there, but it doesn't look like there's any new, you know, firing offs or anything on the ridge, on Grizzly Ridge above Taylorsville. Um, so if anyone's got info on the current plan there, I'd love to hear it. All right, coming back out of here. I know this map's kind of cluttered, but what you gonna do? Got, got all these labels. Um, I wrote a post on the lookout about this um, this town here called Westwood that I'm from, and um, I'm really proud of that article. So if you um, if you're just checking out these YouTube videos, check out our site, the lookout. If you click on there's a tab on the side. There's a, a link called People, and um, I wrote a story there. I'd, I'd love for you to check it out. Anyway, uh, it's my hometown. We're moving up north here, and um, we've been looking at this area up by Silver Lake and Bogard for um, several days now. There's kind of been an unfolding saga there um, where the fire spotted over some of our control lines. And it's kind of just kept a lot of people busy. Um, the story here now is that um, this area that burned from Silver Lake on the left over towards Highway 44 on the center of the screen, now that the wind's not blowing as hard from the southwest, the fire kind of wants to move to the north. Um, this is north. <coughs> we got a bunch of dozer lines out in front of it. Um, who knows what will happen there. Um, you can see all the other spots here on the right. I think some of those have been getting picked up. Anyway, this is um, the thing that's interesting out here is just that we're, this is the edge of the desert, really. Um, you know, we're on the east side of Lassen Park which is the purple line here on the left. And we've got Caribou Wilderness, and this is all high country that's like over 7,000 feet. So the fires now come down out of the high country into these plateaus. And when you look at where these plateaus are, really we're like kind of on the ragged edge of where trees even grow. So by Eagle Lake over here, by the time you get out to Eagle Lake, you're really in the desert, in the Great Basin. Now past there, you know, there's some a few trees on the tops of the hills, but you're really in the desert. And so as firefighters, we know that like, Fighting fire in the desert is way different than fighting fire in, you know, um, Placerville or in, you know, the west side of the mountains. Um, winds change. Winds are fierce. They change often. Um, fuels are flashy. Uh, what you learn fighting fire in the desert is like when you get to the fire, park your truck in something that's already black. Because if you don't, and you go out and work for a shift, you know, you might come back and your truck might be on fire because the wind shifted 180 degrees twice in 30 minutes. So anyway, um, that just creates you know challenges for firefighting that you know we've been talking all along about how dry fuels are, but in the desert they're even drier, and then the winds you know we're in a time of year now where the winds are really shiftable too, where you know we start to get east winds and north winds. When you look at where we are, you know zooming out and more geography is that we're on the east side of the Cascade Mountains, and we've got nothing between the fire and Canada. Um, but high plains and lava flows, right? So we can have this weather that just blows down out of, you know, Idaho or Oregon. Um, it doesn't really hit anything. And there's no mountains to block it. It just flows down across the landscape until it gets where we are with our fire. So we're in this really dynamic kind of part of the world here, uh, dry and windy, and we've just kind of seen what happens here with, um, you know, wind driving our fires with spots being lofted. 
So it's a really tough place to fight fire. It's deceiving because it's flat in a lot of places and there's roads everywhere. And so, you know, um, especially I think when firefighters come from out of the area, um, there's a lot of kind of cruel tricks that this landscape plays on firefighters. And it seems that um, every team that comes up here has to learn those the hard way. So um, I wish them luck tying this in. Hopefully we'll get you know, good weather conditions to you know, do some major firing operations. Unless we can have a really concerted effort and um, you know, we can't just really <coughs> chase this fire like it's an initial attack. We can't just you know, send a bunch of people out to hot spot and put in you know, hose lays or whatever. Like, boxing this in is gonna require a, you know, a major kind of concerted effort. Sometimes that takes a week to pull off as far as, you know, let's come out and snag this and prep this and fire it. We might not have the time to do that. So hopefully, you know, we'll get a break. Um, we'll, have a, we'll have a good strategy, a good plan. But, you know, without that long-term strategy, without that long-term plan, without that commitment of focused amount of massive resources, it's really hard for us to hold on to firing operations in these conditions, in these landscapes. Last thing I want to come in on here, um, it's a story we've told a lot on this fire. Sorry for the shenanigans. I'm running a mouse on my knee here, sitting on a bathtub. Um, now we're looking at Lassen Peak on the right-hand side of the screen, and the middle of the screen is blue, is burned in 2012. It's a reading fire. We've talked about that quite a bit on the lookout on the website. Is um, This is another prescribed burn that was kind of a black eye. Um, it wasn't really a prescribed burn, it was a natural ignition of a lightning fire in 2012 that the National Park Service managed for resource benefit until it escaped and made a big run and left the park. So the park you can see is purple. And as long as it stayed in the park, it kind of was the park's own problem. But once it burned out onto the National Forest, then you know people got pissed. It burned onto private timberland. Um, got a friend who was an FMO up there when that happened and you know, um, it's, it's lucky that we have had some really um, courageous leadership in the Park Service that has backed up their people uh, when things like this happen. Cause, and that's one of the reasons that the Forest Service has not been able to put more fire on the ground in the landscape scale. They haven't had the national scale leadership that really has their back when something really goes wrong. And the Park Service, um, they've had people that backed up their people on the ground. And so, you know, in some circumstances, losing a fire like this could be the end of your career in fire. And it wasn't. Um, the person that was in charge when this happened in the park is um, one of our senior leaders today and uh, you know, a very important part of how we fight fires on the landscape scale. And so um, that's part of the story is this human side of the story that you know, it takes leadership and it takes support of the people under you to really embolden people to do the things they need to do, like using fire on landscape scale. And so to come back to this fire that was a fiasco and, you know, cause of a lot of, you know, op-eds in the Reading Searchlight General saying the for, you know, Park Service is irresponsible, this is reckless. Well, that fire has held the Dixie fire now for several weeks. Um, the burn scar is just not carrying fire under the condition we have. Um, <clears throat> There's some firing that looks like it's going to take place around the northern boundary of this. Um, I understand that you know people want containment, they don't want to see open line on the map. Um, so they're going to put fire here along the edge of this, it, it looks like, judging from where you see this firing that started here. Um, I'm not sure that they need to. Um, it's unclear if this fire is ever going to push there. Um, it's one of those tough calls, but if we just because the fire's not spreading here doesn't mean that if we put fire on the ground here um, on the edge of this area that hasn't burned for, uh, you know, a hundred years, it, it's risky putting fire on the ground here and the fire that we've had back in here for days hasn't moved that far into the burn. So, um, you know, fire crews are kind of damned if they do and damned if they don't. If they don't fire this and get what they consider to be full containment, then, and this fire comes out of there, then uh, they look bad. If they put fire on the ground here and it gets away, they look bad. But what I would say is that putting a whole bunch of fire along this unburned area, if we look at our track record in this area over the past two weeks, we're losing more fire than we're holding. So um, this is a tough spot. Um, be interesting to see what happens here. I'm not going to second guess um, the people on the ground. I'm just um, pointing out kind of the big picture is that 
the Reading fire has kept the Dixie fire from burning out here into a place where the north and east winds could carry it out and make it a really much bigger problem for all the way down to Reading, right? So um, these are the games that we play when we look at fire and landscape scale, but I, I want to keep telling this story about the Reading fire because um, we need more fire on the ground. And even fire we put on the ground, like the Reading fire or the Capos fire, that gets away from us and is politically um, difficult um, is what's kind of buying us advantages. You know, without this burn here, this fire would be in Shingletown already. Because we, when it was burning this direction, we had not enough resources. We were trying to save Westwood. We were trying to save Susanville and Janesville and Milford, Chester, Lake Almanor Peninsula, Hamilton Branch. This fire has bought us over a month of time to come, and now we're finally coming and looking at it. Um, my hope is that we don't, just because we've got open line here, it doesn't um, rush us into trying to get this fired. And the firing here looks like it's been uh, going on for many days now. So that's what I've got to say about that. Um, history is important. Telling these stories is important. Um, your support of the lookout helps us tell these stories um, based in place. Appreciate your support and um, good luck to all of you. Good luck to all the firefighters. Um, check now.